Um, <laughs> When I originally agreed to come here to this symposium, I, I was honored to get the invitation. I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, where my work is heading, and that is uh, thinking about intersex in relation to trans. And, it's, and, and I've published a little bit on this already, co-authored publication in a paper that came out in Gender and Society titled Giving Sex, Deconstructing Intersex and Trans Medicalization. And in that paper, with my colleagues, we ask a really basic question. How is it that intersex people or why is it that intersex people are subjected to interventions they don't want, while trans folks have difficulties, a lot, of getting any sort of interventions that they might want? And how does this happen? So what we, how that paper came to be was that uh, I was at a conference, a sociology conference, and there was a, a person, a sociologist, on that panel who had interviewed um, so-called experts in, in the field of trans medicalization. And we then thought, why not co uh, collaborate and put something together? And that is um, how that project sort of developed. And this is where my work is heading, um, also thinking about the ways in which um, youth are included or not in decision-making practices um, across so-called diagnoses, and why is it um, the, their agency more afforded to them in some conditions and less in others? Um, that's something else I'm working on. And then I'm also looking at, um, I, I'm a, working on a, my second book project, which is titled Intersexy Fat. And that is, um, how is it, and this was commissioned by NYU Press, how is it that, um, what, what, the extremes to which we go to to pursue the ideal body. And there I talk about, that sort of developed from a blog I wrote actually, um, called by the same name, Intersexy Fat. And for those of us um, in, who do public sociology, who do activism and advocacy, there's a lot of tension about what's the benefit of that. And quite frankly, as an intersex activist, as an academic, I care a lot less about what happens in the so-called ivory tower and a lot more about what happens outside of that ivory tower. And I write pieces that I, um, in addition to doing scholarship, to sort of figure out how can we disseminate that knowledge. It's so important for people to have that knowledge. And in that piece on intersexy fat, what I did was I said, listen, you know, as an intersex person, I hated being intersex. I felt stigmatized when I uncovered the diagnosis. I was lied to, I was subjected to medically unnecessary and irreversible interventions. And now, I talk about intersex as if I would talk about getting my hair cut. I would say colored, but they did a really bad job. I tried to get more gray and it didn't work, so sorry. Um, these are real gray, but yeah, anyhow, I wanted more gray. But I talk about intersex like anything else. And in that blog, I talk about um, how I still feel a sense of shame and secrecy and um, basically path being pathologized um, by medical providers and others about being fat. And how is it that I can sort of bridge these experiences? And perhaps if I own being fat, then maybe, just maybe, I can be liberated by it in the same way I've been liberated by talking about my intersex experience. So all that to say in the two minutes is that I wanted to come here today and talk to you about how it is that what I and my co-authors argue is that doctors give gender to their patients, but they do so by giving sex. And that work is building on the tradition of um, a number of scholars who have talked about the ways in which, say, the partners of trans folks, Jane Ward, a sociologist, says that they give their partners gender. They may talk about their bodies in particular ways, et cetera, right? They, they treat them in particular ways, and that is the process by which partners give, uh, the partners of trans folks give their partners um, gender, or uh, one, a, one component of that giving gender process. Tay Meadows, sociologist of Columbia, sort of took, take, took that a little further in, in some ways and built on it and talks about, and they have a forthcoming book, I think it's called Trans Kids, but they are talking about the ways in which parents also engage in some of these giving gender um, processes. And they do so by validating their child's identities and speaking to their child in ways that um, validate who they are, or they feel they are, okay, or whatever even are means. Um, and that's uh, what we do, and my, co my co-authors and I, what we try to say is that doctors also engage in giving gender, but they do so by giving sex. So that was gonna be the focus of my talk, 
Unfortunately, I'm going to shift gears based on some of the presentations at the last minute, and I'm going to talk more about my book. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I was born with an intersex trait, although my parents didn't know that. I was born outside of Chicago in October of 1980. Um, I was a happy, healthy baby girl. Inside, instead of um, ovaries, a uterus, and fallopian tubes, I had testes. They didn't know that. Okay, so my parents, uh, Georgia and George, they named me Georgian. They're not the most creative. <laughs> That's me in the red dress. My brother, they named George. No, I'm kidding about that one. <laughs> they named him Nick, uh, th thankfully for him. Um, but everything was all good, and, um, you know, I, I, my parents are immigrants from Greece. Everything was going um, swell uh, until I was about 13 years old, and I was running around outside with my um, friends, and I was experiencing abdominal pain. And my mom was, at first, she thought, she brought me inside, said, you must be getting your period. She talked to me about that. I said, no, that's not what's happening to me. And then um, I continued to play, continued to have the pain. She got increasingly concerned. She must have been concerned because for my working class mother to take us to a health care provider when we didn't have health insurance meant she was really concerned. So I know that for a fact, I'm sure. So she took me to an urgent care center, and there they did all these sorts of tests. Well, they found out nothing was wrong with me. I was just having pain from not running around very much regularly. You know the cramps you get sometimes? Apparently, you all don't do that either. If you run, you'll get those little pains. <laughs> Hard audience. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, but in the process of figuring out nothing was wrong with me, that is where they then discovered that I was intersex. And inside, they discovered I had testes, all of this. They didn't tell me the truth about the diagnosis. They told me I had um, underdeveloped ovaries that were, going, that were turning malignant. They told me at one point, at different points, they said I had mono. They said all these different things. Apparently, I wasn't the smartest, you know, 12, 13-year-old because I just went around thinking, hey, I have, you know, pre malignant ovaries, but they told me we're going to wait till I'm 17 to take them out. Um, never mind the fact, something else I'm thinking about is, what does that say when, when that rhetoric is used about that could be cancerous? What does it say to, to about people who are struggling with a cancer diagnosis? And sort of taking that diagnosis and imposing it on another group. And that's still often used. I think one of, someone on this side was asking a question about what are the rates of malignancy and this and that. Well, there's any one of us in this room could develop any sort of cancer. I'm not an oncologist, but I imagine you can get cancer in any part of your body, maybe not your eyeballs, but I bet an ophthalmologist would say, yes, your eyeballs too. So we don't go around removing all aspects of our body. So why is it in cases of intersex we do that? Um, so I was a, a little bit older when I got my medical records. At this point in my life, I was already, um, I had the surgery in 1997. I didn't see my medical records. But I um, was a PhD student by 2006. Um, I went to um, get my PhD to study patterns of medical specialization. Why doctors go into the specialties and how these are shaped by mentorship experiences. It's another line of my work, but it, it ended up being not the focus of my work in my graduate training. And that is because I decided in a feminist theory class to wrestle um, with what had happened to me when I obtained my medical records a few years earlier, and I got those medical records, I read them, I read this, I said, it, it said, and this was, uh, I was about uh, 21 years old when I read this, it said, after extensive discussion, I feel the patient needs surgery to have the gonads removed. She is not aware of any chromosome studies, and most literature agrees it's best she not be aware of the chromosome studies. She has been told she is missing her um, uterus, she does have a vagina, she has no tube, she has been told she may have streaked ovaries, and they should be removed because of the possibility of developing gonadal cancer. So I read this, I read chromosomal testing, I read XY, I, w I felt really ashamed, I, um, uh, Dr. Valine talked about this earlier, about disclosure, th there, there wasn't full disclosure, I felt really um, bad. I had just obtained my records because I wanted them, and I saw this, I threw them in the dumpster. So that's where I found myself years later in that feminist theory class, where we were reading about intersex, and I thought, if, if I felt kind of slimy. We were talking about intersex around the table, the small, you know, 10-person um, seminar. And here I was having this so-called secret. And um, that was in, enforced on me, basically, because they, I was never told the truth. And that's when I decided to get my medical records, had to request a second rec uh, set of records. I threw the first ones away. And that's where I got these. And, um, and I decided to... Um, first experience what it would be like to study intersex in that class, and that sort of evolved to my 
book. Um, but when I decided seriously, <laughs> those are the hermaphrodites with attitude turning the lights on. Um, I think because it's getting a little darker in here, literally and figuratively. <laughs> All right, so um, when I decided in that seminar to write that paper and do some work and theorize more about it and begin what was going to just be a seminar paper, I started to um, think about why, why don't I know about these intersex folks? Because I was reading about all these intersex folks. Nobody told me other intersex folks existed. Nobody told me there was activism happening. So I went to um, Google, you know, who, well, who am I kidding? It was like Yahoo, you know, or something like that. But, and I started um, Yahooing um, <laughs> things, and this image that Dr. Villain showed you earlier showed up. And, you know, I knew I always had attitude, but I didn't know I was a hermaphrodite with attitude in that way. And I started um, wanting to get in touch. So I got all ready. Um, I went to my first intersex conference to talk to folks. And I showed up at this intersex conference, um, the then named Androgen Insensitivity Syndrome Support Group, USA. Happened to be meeting in Chicago of that year in 2008. And I showed up, and I expected to find the hermaphrodites with the attitude. They were very secretive on the website, everything else. And what did I ended up finding was not the hermaphrodites with attitude, but a group of mostly women, um, there was me in the middle, um, crowded around, and these were folks who uh, wanted to come forward for a public photo. Okay, so these, this is publicly available photo on Wikipedia. And um, it was shocking to me because I saw doctors presenting alongside intersex folks. Um, I saw there was a lot more collaboration I didn't see those hermaphrodites with attitude. But I also saw at the same time that there was a lot of pain and suffering by both um, parents of intersex young kids, uh, adults, and everything else in these closed private sessions. And that's when I decided to switch gears and to, um, and to explore the ways in which intersex is experienced in contemporary US society. Um, yeah. So. Sorry, this is going. And that work evolved into my book, Contesting Intersex, um, The Dubious Diagnosis. Okay, so in the book, I, I, I kind of come to it with a several theoretical frameworks. One is that diagnoses are only as real as their definition. I call intersex a dubious diagnosis, not because it's not real. Trust me, I know it's not real. I know it's real, excuse me. I have an intersex trait. I have androgen insensitivity syndrome. However, um, how we define it, which I think um, Dr. Villain did a great job talking about the way in which we push the definition forward or how we redefine what it means, that is, to me, one way in which we um, sort of can classify something as a, a particular uh, condition or trait or disorder based on how we uh, define it. Um, and then I also am working with um, uh, biological citizenship and this notion of problematic persons, thinking about Nicholas Rose's work and Carlos Novas. And earlier, when I'm talking about diagnoses, of course, I'm talking about Anne-Marie Jutel, I'm talking about uh, Conrad, et cetera, other medical sociologists. And then third, I'm talking about gender as a stratification system beyond individual characteristics. So, um, us as social scientists, we've moved far beyond this ideal that gender is whether you wear pink or blue. Like in the case of those young kids that Dr. Villain you saw in your office, where one was wearing a pink shirt, one was wearing a blue shirt, I did not know, right, that there were still these expectations that pink means girl and blue means boy. I mean, I don't know, sometimes I wear men's clothes or something and you find pink in like the men's section, quite often actually these days, or you know, whatever hegemonically attractive man is wearing, then that's what we see trends changing. I guess not, you don't agree. Well. You need fashion classes, I guess. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. um, so these are the theoretical frameworks I'm working with. And the theoretical questions I want to ask, and we're going to talk about today, is what can we learn from the trajectory of the intersex rights movement about diagnostic processes? What happens when biological citizenship collides with nomenclature and identity politics? And how does gender as a stratification system influence experiences with medical diagnoses? So, you know, I always tell my students, like, I want practical research questions. 
Um, I, I am an empiricist. I'm not just you know, trying to theorize about these things. But I want to know how did intersex become a disorder of sex development? We heard some perspectives earlier about that. But I want to give you a, maybe a, a little bit different of a, a take. Um, second is, how is biological citizenship achieved in the intersex community? Biological citizenship, as uh, conceptualized by Nicholas uh, Rose and Carl Snovas, is this idea that we are, um, and others as well, they're building on others' work, Foucault, of course, but this idea that we are um, adhering to particular practices when they're from the, for, that sort of define us as, say, healthy or unhealthy. So in the case of, say, weight loss, it's about are you drinking so many ounces of water a day? Are you doing 30 minutes of uh, walking a day? And then you see Fitbits popping up and all these different devices and mechanisms to classify us as biological citizenship, actively working towards achieving something that is defined for us. Um, third is does one's understanding of gender that's how they conceptualize gender. Is it pink and blue for some folks? Or is it broader about a system of inequality? How does that influence their ability to access biological citizenship? So um, between 2009 and 11, I um, traveled around the country. I interviewed multiple stakeholders, including intersex people, their parents, and uh, medical experts. Um, and I'm, this is following the sort of methodology of Katrina Carcasis, a bioethicist and medical anthropologist at Stanford and I did um, ethnographic observations of various organizations. And in terms of like uh, others that were not active looking at documents and so on. We can talk more about it later if you want. So I'm gonna talk about several key findings. Um, and I talk about these, I outline these more in my book. The first is um, something to do with methodology. Most of us when we write a book, an empirical book, um, we take the methodology and we shove it in an appendix if we get it at all. And I actually think that's dangerous and problematic. And I think we all are, have positionality. We all have to be reflexive about who, where we're coming from when we're talking about whatever it is we're doing. Um, so I actually um, put this up front in my book because I wanted to sort of make it clear that when I entered this study, um, I, wasn't an in, I wasn't a pure insider. I didn't know the history. I didn't know that history at all. In fact, I you know, was shocked to learn it when I first engaged with it. Um, but I wasn't an outsider because I had that personal connection to the topic. So I was embodying this, in, what I call this insider-outsider status. So I had a personal connection to the topic, but I did not have a historical connection to the community or the topic at hand. That afforded me lots of access and trust. A lot of folks said it's, uh, like Ann, for example, said it, it was an intersex person, said it made it more comfortable, it's easier for me to talk to you. Marty said, you've experienced this, you have a connection. If you were just somebody, if your child, child didn't have it or you didn't have it, then I think I wouldn't do this. She points to my recorder. It's like a sisterhood. Um, next, uh, I talk about this ideal of collective confrontation to contested collaboration. So um, when the hermaphrodites with attitude were protesting at medical association meetings when, you know, I was young, er, um, <laughs> They were embodying what I think about as collective confrontation. They were us versus them. Um, and then you saw some, a shift. And you saw a shift in, as evident, and, and I'm glad Dr. Villain did a lot of legwork for me, but like the consensus meeting was in 2005. There were two intersex activists debated about whether or not they were involved or not, blah, 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 in terms of what they had to contribute. But they were there, and I argue that these moments were Cheryl Chase, the, found, the founder of the Intersex Society of North America, and certainly one of the, um, the leaders, uh, the uh, leaders of the intersex advoc uh, birth of the intersex rights movement in the U.S., um, was presenting at medical association meetings. So you started seeing this shift from hermaphrodites with attitude rar and to contested collaboration, where folks, some intersex actors, were choosing to work or try to work with medical providers to promote change, while others um, were adamantly against that. And they thought, think of Audre Lorde for the feminist in the room who can evoke things like you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. They were that, that's the, the rhetoric that they were critiquing. So I'm just going to give you an, a quote or some examples. So this ideal that intersex medical care wasn't improving, uh, I think Dr. Villain did a, a great um, about job telling us all about that. But Cheryl Chase, she told me, quote, I engineered the entire thing. She said she get, getting the language changed into the consensus thing by working through allies. 
and she was talking about medical allies. There were some progressive people in there and there were some powerful people who were on my side and I wanted to talk to them about what ISNA, the Intersex Society of North America, thought we would like to have happen. So she um, takes credit for that terminology, hoping it would improve the, the situation. And that created a lot of tension. Um, that's this contested collaboration. An intersex activist I spoke to, Mercury, said working with the medical community has become working for the medical community because there's been no specific gains. And now the pathologizing terminology, which originated in the medical community because some practitioners were using disorder already, has been stamped upon us. So it's like, what have we got out of this? Malarka said, DSD is not, is not something a lot of people want to identify with. Nobody wants to be a disorder. Who wants to be a fucking disorder? I don't. Pigeon said, I prefer hermaphrodite or intersex. I feel like the language shift to DSD makes no sense to me. I don't feel it was necessary. But then you had an intersex activist say, I can be on the outside of the room arguing about terminology. And if I feel, um, if I have embraced DSD and the doors open, let's have a real good substantive conversation because we're talking about the same thing, you can call me frog. I don't give a crap what you call me as long as we're moving forward advocating for families and advocating for small children that don't have a voice. So when people want to argue till the cows come home that, that disorder is such an ugly word and we're not disorders, we're not disordered, oh, get the fuck over it. Um, but, well, what, what is happening here? I argue in my book that 1990s intersex activism where folks were protesting at medical association meetings, where folks were appearing um, on Oprah, Montel Williams show, specifically in the 90s, but then writing in New York Times, 2020, et cetera, that was challenging medical authority and jurisdiction over the ability to treat intersex. And I argue that Medical authority was in jeopardy. So the one way in which medical authority was being able to be reasserted was by reinventing the nomenclature. And then the doctors no longer fix intersex. They treat disorders of sex development. And also, by the way, you have a mismatch now. You have intersex activists who are public hating that term DSD, so they don't use it, myself included, in public spaces. So we don't use it, what happens? There thereby escape the criticism of disorder. Uh, the uh, doctors can thereby escape the criticism of disorder of sex development uh, me medicalization practices. So how did I come up with this? Well, talking to a lot of medical experts. Um, one doctor, and these are all pseudonyms, Dr. D said, so the original folks who self-aggregated hated the medical community or were very angry with them, not inappropriately for the way that they had been treated. Dr. C said, intersex activism led anyone who ever heard the story, physicians, especially parents and patients, to be extremely suspicious of everything we do, and rightfully so. I mean, it was all coming out. Your integrity is the one thing that you work the longest to get, and with just one, light, one slight fraction results in a total loss of integrity. And I'm trying to teach my kids this. They were literally talking about their kids. I was at their home. Very nice folks. All day long, that authority is the one thing you have to guard like your jewels. Now it came under great suspicion, and I think that the only way to make it right is to make it now more clear. And to make it more clear was by defining it as a disorder of sex development, is what I argue. Don't take my word for it. Dr. Valene said it as well. That, and you go to PubMed, you only see disorder of sex development in publications. Intersex is not there anymore. All over. Disorder, 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 disorder. Um, so... Okay, let's move forward. So we have labels. Um, la it's just a term is just a label. Um, but one thing, and I talk more about this in the book, not here, I don't have time to do it, but these labels, as you might imagine, and I think some folks in the audience talked about this, can potentially be, can do two things. One, they can stigmatize people and how people see about themselves, but also imagine you're the parents of a new child and something is presented to you as a disorder. Now, I'm not a parent to, um, you know, children of the human kind, but I do have animals, the four-legged and two-legged, I have some birds, and whatever my veterinarian says, you know, if they say your, 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 your rescue dog is sick, they need this, well, I'm going to say, when can you do this? When can you move forward with this? It's usually my second question. My first question is, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> if you have animals, you know how expensive they can get. So... 
This is where access to biological citizenship comes in. I, I say, I are, uh, by talking to folks, um, you'll see this. Liz, who prefers DSD, she said a doctor cleared everything up. I saw a couple of other doctors in my city that also cleared everything up. You see these positive relationship with doctors. Tara, who prefers DSD, said my diagnosis was straightforward. The doctor was really nice about it, supportive, summed it up like you basically are born like a woman that had a hysterectomy. You just have to take estrogen to help with your bones. We're going to remove your gonads. She prefers DSD. Um, Hannah, who prefers DSD, she says, my dad was really there for me. He's the person that I turned to, having conversations, crying on the phone till 2 in the morning while everybody else in the house was asleep. I was on the phone with him. Vanessa, she prefers DSD. She says, my parents have always been supportive of me and try to make me a happy person. Okay, so these folks prefer DSD language. These are just several of many people I talk to. Um, but these particular folks prefer DSD. They have positive relationship with providers, and they seem to have supportive relationship with parents. So why, what's the issue there? Well, the issue is they would tell me things like, Georgianne, when you put a hat on, do you ever look like a man? I said, mm, well, wouldn't anyone? I mean... <laughs> I don't, I don't know what you mean. If you fem it up, and other people would say the same thing. Um, they started feeling really abnormal. One woman said to me, you know, I went to get my teeth cleaned, and I was so afraid that the doctor, the dentist, excuse me, the dentist could tell that I had XY chromosomes by um, the structure of my teeth. So I went to my car. I was like, how many teeth do XY people have? I was like, what the hell? I'm not a dentist. Um, I hope this is nice water. I don't want it like poisoned or anything. Um, so there's these issues, they feel stigmatized. Others in romantic situations, they would say, ask their partners after intimacy, um, you know, did you notice anything different about my vagina or anything different about my genitalia or anything different about my areolas? Um, they felt really abnormal. Some would avoid sexual intimacy altogether. I'm all for asexuality, but if not, when it's not a choice. Um, Others, by the way, would engage in um, what I talk about in, in the book, too, is engage in these practices, um, in sexual um, ex encounters to uh, validate their gender. They wanted to feel like a woman. So they engage in lots of different sexual uh, encounters to do so. That's not just intersex people, by the way. A lot of folks do that, right? Um, but, and I, I'm all for, like, enjoying it and loving sex and doing whatever you need to do, but, again, it's about... The issue for me as a sociologist was about um, how they were using that to validate that they were assigned the right gender and they're real women. Okay, but look what happens when you don't like DSD. Folks were telling me things like, I just find genetic experts dogmatic. They have it all figured out and that doesn't sound like science to me. Just because they have a doctor in front of their name, when I was younger I was a lot more respectful of that. Malarka says, I don't like doctors. I don't go to the doctor very often. I don't trust doctors. That's a very triggering environment for me. So for the medical professionals in this room, or folks who train medical professionals, or you get them in the rotations or whatever, think about what this means if that language is stigmatizing and people feel that it can um, make them feel pathologized. What does that mean for how we're able, I'm talking like as if I'm a doctor, I'm not a doctor, but if physicians are able to tr treat, how does that impact what folks are being treated, um, or when they go to your office, or if they even will go to your office. Um, Paul, who rejects DSD, says the parents know the elephant is in the room, and you're not really supposed to talk about the elephant in the room. I'm not in a very good relationship with my mom. I think the whole thing is deeply troubling. Pigeon says, I think a lot of times our parents are so scared that doctors made the wrong decision, and we're going to veer off to this other gender world, so they kind of police it. My parents didn't technically tell me all the time that you're a girl and you're going to be a girl, but I'm sure that was always playing in the background of decision making. So here you have then folks who reject DSD. Those folks seem to have fractured relationships with doctors, fractured relationships with parents. So it's like, well, um, that doesn't work. Well, maybe they should all, um, what are they getting out of it then? What's happening? Well, they don't have that feeling of pathologization and they don't feel... Um, uh, abnormal and many of these folks will embrace intersex so what, it, what what does this mean for us theoretically well I argue that in order to access biological citizenship to not be that problematic person you need to embrace disorder of sex development because of the power embedded within medicine as an institution 
Otherwise, you reject it, you're not going to be able to access biological citizenship. You're going to have a fractured relationship with doctors. Your care is going to suffer, your overall health. All right, so DSD nomenclature, I argue, is a perfect opportunity for doctors, well intended, perhaps, to reclaim jurisdiction of intersex and reassert authority. I argue that DSD is a key to biological citizenship. People are often um, surprised, and I've gotten a lot of heat uh, but from this from intersex activists, that I say, you know what? I don't like disorder of sex development as an intersex activist myself in person. I don't like that term. I think it's really problematic for a lot of the folks that they say. But what I think we can maybe think about is how, going back to this idea that diagnosis are only as real as their definition, what about if we were able to strategically employ the diagnosis in a way that allows us to, or gives us the ability to benefit from what it can offer, but then at the same time know that it's only as real as its definition so we aren't disordered? Um, strategically employ it. If, use, if saying I have a disorder of sex development is going to prevent me um, from saying being discriminated against in my workplace or getting some sort of access to something that I don't have, then why shouldn't I employ it? But the only way to employ it without the consequences of it is that you have to know that sex, gender, and sexuality are these fluid phenomenon that are constantly in flux. Pink, maybe in the 70s or 60s, was not masculine, but it certainly can be masculine today. I think all these folks wear it. I, um, I don't know. Um, but um, I want to skip that for time. But um, I want to just quickly... Um, go through a few things that are happening in intersex uh, human rights, intersex activism in general. So as uh, Dr. Villain talked about, the Intersex Society of North America was founded by Cheryl Chase. That organization um, closed in the summer of 2008. But since, all these other intersex organizations have popped up. Intersex activacy, advocacy and activism is flying um, all around the world. And, and I, I don't think I mentioned it because we had the audio snag at the beginning, but I wear multiple hats every time I present. I'm an intersex activist, past president of the AIS DSD support group, which is the largest intersex support group for people in the world. Um, I'm the current board president for Interact, Advocates for Intersex Youth. And I'm also a, a sociologist, a medical sociologist who studies the ways in which diagnoses are experienced in society. Um, but you see all these organizations popped up all around. These are just some that I could fit on the screen. And if you look back here, you see, it's a little hard to see, but this photo right here, that was the one I showed you earlier. This was going to be a publicly available photo. I believe it was um, Dr. Heater who was talking about uh, medical photography or came up uh, with Dr. Villain's question. And it's an interesting thing. That photo in the lower left-hand corner came because folks at that intersex meeting were upset that when you Googled or Yahooed or whatever, you got to intersex on Wikipedia, there were photos of naked people standing there with bars over their face and their genitalia flaunted. And people said, you, if, if Wikipedia, not that we are going to you know, reify Wikipedia, but if, if, Wiki, if people who go to Wikipedia want to know what intersex people are, look like, we're going to show you what intersex people look like. And that's what this came to be, right here. Um, and that was a room full of 200, 300 people who said, who wants to be in a publicly available photo? And that's who moved forward. Then it went to this, then it went to this, then it went to this, and then this isn't even the most recent one, it went to here where people were angry that they couldn't even be in the photo that would be up. Um, that's quite a bit, and someone put this together. I did not do that, how we've grown. I, I wouldn't use purple fonts and, or cursive font. I don't even know what font is. But I think it's a telling from that, that background. Um, lots of advocacy as well. Um, what, a lot of you, I know some of you said you teach, so I think it's important to think about some resources that are available, but there's a great BuzzFeed video of what it's like to be intersex. Um, I've done some of my own advocacy. Uh, Pigeon Pagonis was recognized as a champion of change by the Obama administration. Another, um, you see intersex people getting their voices out at all different um, venues, continuing to do so including um, in this uh, documentary, which is phenomenal in my opinion. It's available for free online. You can stream it. It's called Intersection. Um, and then you see Malta becomes the first country to ban surgery on intersex children in April of 2015, while we still continue to perform these surgeries here. Um, so, and, and Malta is not an anomaly. Um, what you see here is a, a meeting of intersex activists from all around the world who convened a meeting uh, in Malta, and that invited legislature, uh, invited uh, 
politicians to come to that meeting, and that's what sort of evolved and developed into Malta making the first um, move. Um, you have here um, issues about sex testing in the Olympics um, and in other um, elite at competition. Uh, colleagues of mine, um, I co-authored a paper uh, talking about the ways in which uh, these hyperandrogenism policies that were released in 2012, um, I believe they were 2012, yeah, uh, that they were released were um, problematic and they perpetuated various uh, ideas about bodies, they created whisper triggers about who might be intersex or who might not be, and of this ideal about um, fairness in elite competitions. And how do we know um, this, this drawing a connection between testosterone does not work the same for everyone? Um, and this is where you have folks who have very high levels of testosterone, maybe very hairy all over the place, but they can't, they're not physically competitive or have, um, so we kind of draw some co competition there. And then you see Judy Chand um, was a, you know, publicly sort of presented in, in this way and challenged. Um, it's important to note that Castor Semenya and Duty Chan never identified as intersex. Those are labels that the media and others have put on them. Um, and that's why I try to be conscious and, and not uh, mention these folks as being intersex. I don't know if they are. But they were caught under, caught under these hyperandrogenous policies. I also think it's important as a social scientist here today to draw attention to the folks that are caught by these policies that existed um, are from the global south. People of color. And the fact that for Castor Semenya, she won. Would anyone care if she didn't win the race? Or if she was a white woman from down the street or a grad student at UCLA? I don't think so. So that was something else I, I just wanted to make a connection there. Um, but those policies were challenged and, um, and, and successfully, um, many will argue, um, and that is that um, they were going to block Duty Chan from competing and she filed a, a, a uh, appeal and with working with the Court of Arbitration for Sport and, um, and she won that appeal and she was able to win and she didn't uh, or able to race and she didn't win no one cares then you don't win it's fine um, that year um, Castor Semenya did win gold though you have other um, legal things happening the first uh, intersex birth certificate issued in New York City that was uh, not that long ago in December of the 16 um, and you have uh, Dana Zim suing the Secretary of State for not having a, uh, be the ability to have an intersex passport. You have the United Nations uh, High Commissioner saying for human rights, thinking about these intersex surgeries as uh, violations and human rights violations. Um, and then in my home state, well, that feels kind of strange saying that, but I'm a transplant, but I live in Nevada as a professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. In Nevada, we try to put forward uh, Senate Bill 408 with Gender Justice Nevada. They were the spearheading this, and it got through um, the Senate, it got through, um, uh, through the hearing committee, then through the Senate, and then it went to the Assembly of Health and Human Services. I went to testify there along with Dr. Arlene Barrett, who's an intersex activist. She's also a physician. Um, she was there to testify against it, um, as I was, and there were also a lineup of 12 or so folks um, lobbyists, paid lobbyists, representing medical associations against this bill. And in my opinion, um, cowardly is that the Assembly of Health and Human Services never voted on it. They allowed it to die in the Assembly, which I've since learned because I'm trying to, you know, learn about politics now, that um, sometimes they'll let things die because they don't want a record of how they voted. And they, we fully expected it to get through the assembly, um, but we didn't know if it, the governor, a Republican governor, would sign it in law. That Senate Bill 408, all it said was that you need to slow down the process and not perform surgeries on children. By the way, hypospadias was excluded, even. That you should not perform surgeries on intersex children until they are old enough to make their own decisions and or the parents have had some time. If it's not medically necessary and it's not an emergency, you shouldn't do it right away. That's all it said. Um, but intersex people continue to protest and continue to stand out, so maybe we're seeing back a flip. I don't know, but maybe we do. Back to this um, contested, um, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, con cult uh, confrontation, uh, what have you. All right, so I showed you earlier this sign, and I'm almost done, that you see disorder sex development popping up everywhere. 
in medical literature. I wrote a piece in June of 2015 where I think it's a really important piece. Is I, I asked intersex activists and others who were reading this piece, well, intersex buzz, do we avoid it or do we engage with disorder of sex development terminology? And the reason why I wrote this blog is because um, that intersex video um, from BuzzFeed, what it's like to be intersex, I think today has over six million views, which is incredible for intersex advocacy. Um, but no one in there talks about disorder of sex development. So I wonder then if parents who of newly diagnosed child, a newly diagnosed child with a disorder of sex development will make that connection between something they may have seen on their social media site about intersex activists were saying and um, what providers, the language they're using. How are they thereby escaping any sort of criticism, I am intersex, advocacy, any of us are doing? Um, I don't know. It's a theoretical question or uh, a rhetorical question. Um, then you see in October 2016, we got the US Department of State, the Obama administration, for the first time ever to make a, a, a statement about intersex awareness and to talk about um, the Equal Rights Coalition, et cetera, and about these uh, particular surgeries that are uh, conducted and, and really problematize it. And then um, Trump is elected. So what's Trump's threat to intersex? Right, where does that leave advocacy? Where does it leave where we're all headed? I don't know. Um, this is a great resource interface project. Lots of different narratives and voices. If you teach, you can incorporate those voices into your classroom. Thank you very much. I think I might have a minute or two for questions. Go from there. Thank you. Yes. Sure, I published a co-published co a paper on that in Gender and Society that you can access. It's called Giving Sex, but um, I'm taking that further. But basically, it's about this ideal of um, protecting the, um, idea, the notion that sex, gender, and sexuality need to all be aligned. So um, in the cases of intersex, we're going to normalize the body. We're going to search for any sort of markers that can potentially predict gender. Well, we know there are no indicator, there are no sex markers that are going to predict one's gender. I can't predict gender today or tomorrow. None of us can because we don't know how gender is moving. Our grandmas, our grandpas, and if you think about around the world, it's contextual. So, you know, what is masculine today or feminine today might not be this way tomorrow. And you, I see this as a professor dealing with youth uh, or younger folks all of the time. And I live in the residence halls with the students. I'm a professor in residence. So I, I don't just see it in my classroom. I see it in my hallways. Um, so I think this idea with the intersex is that, okay, well, we're going to move forward because this idea that we can surgically modify the body to match a gender that's assigned. And I think one thing I, I really appreciated all the other presentations today, what Dr. Valen was saying is that intersex activists have never really talked about gender specifically. No one's against gender assignment. You can't live in a, a gender binary world and expect intersex activists to fight that gender structure for you. That's BS. None of us can expect that. It's all of our jobs to raise awareness about it. I don't think it's their job to do it. So assign gender. No one says you don't have to assign gender. Assign gender. Make, fine, make your prediction what's best about gender. But why then surgically modify that child's body based on a prediction of what that gender will be? Because you might be wrong 5% of the time, or 10%, or 50%. I don't care. If you're wrong one time, it doesn't make sense to make that decision. In my opinion, it doesn't make sense to do that, and I know everyone's well intended, that's not the issue, but it's why do we then assign that? Now with trans folks, you see that there's this protection, you have to demonstrate and prove to me that you really are the other gender, as if gender's two, right, binary, that you really are. And you talk to trans folks, and um, two things sh come out, and we talk about this in the paper, one is by the time a trans person who desires transitioning services, seeks medical care for transitioning services, you best believe they thought about it a long time. So the fact that providers in that paper, um, I, or the presentation I was going to show you, is that they slow down the process for trans folks 
Wait, 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 we can't move that fast. But for intersex folks, it's move fast. And also you see this idea that in the case of intersex parents, you know, are viewed as the ones who are making those decisions, demanding that for their child. Well, if you present something as a medical emergency, you're establishing the need for a medical response. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm always um, thinking about the recent approach that you've, you've shown to a number of the intersex advocacy groups, which is now the legal approach and changing the law and basically banning uh -huh. And I'm, you know, I'm a clinician. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm always thinking that blanket laws yeah. outlawing are not necessarily good things yeah. because there will always be situations in which particular surgery actually might be better for the child. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why that is for intersex, that you need to basically have a recourse to law and the United Nations yeah, yeah. and labeling and torture, which doesn't happen for situations of uh, uh, deafness or, or throat clash or things like this, where, you know, basically you let the medical yeah. figure out what's the best practice. And then those who don't respect the best practice, then of course they should, they, they, they should be uh, gone after and they should be uh, mm -hmm. uh, they should have laws that's against them. But that's different than changing the law in the medical profession. Yeah. And is it because there is a distrust from the, from the activist community that doctors are not listening to this, or is it because it's not going fast enough? It's, I, I, I always have a yeah. That it's, that it's going to be, that having a, a blanket ban is going to be better for everyone. I'm, I, I'm truly not sure about that. Yeah. I, I can see the point, definitely. Um, I think when you pointed out things like uh, being of short stature or deaf community, there's a lot of debate within, uh, among deaf act activists and, uh, on all sides of it. And it, it's publicly debated about uh, all different types of interventions that may or may not or should or should not be. I think what we find here with intersex though is something different. Um, and you know, I, I may not come off that way, but I'm actually, you know, I, I am for collaboration. And let me tell you, and I, I'm looking around for someone that I can say, oh, they'll agree with me. If, if this was a room where there was collaboration, uh, activists and I would be able to tell you that. We get a lot of heat from other activists by um, working to try to promote change by working with providers. I can promise you, this is on tape, hi, I'm sure it's going to happen with this that I'm even presenting here. It can. Um, because why, what, what am I getting by doing this type of presentation? Well, I actually really believe in collaboration. And I, and I talk about in the book to some, to some people's dismay, but um, I'm working on a subcommittee with the Association of American Medical Colleges to make, try to improve medical curriculum, for example. How can we think about educating doctors to help in, in, in to, so they, they're not stigmatized? Um, the, the, the patients later in life or then or the parents and how they, you don't want parents to express decisional regret and they do. I mean, Ellen talks a little about this in her book. I talk a little about mine. Um, this, they, they, they age and they learn more and then they express decisional regret. So about the law having a blanket statement, for example, with the SB 408, the Senate bill in Nevada, it wasn't a blanket statement. A blanket statement said you cannot perform it. That's not what it said. It said only in cases that were medically necessary. Or, I mean, you can look up the exact language, but it's like, you shouldn't do medically unnecessary interventions. Where it, gets where it gets complicated is the way in which different folks define what is medically necessary. If someone, I'm not a physician, but if it's medically necessary, and it's absolutely medically necessary, then cut people's genitalia. I don't care. Of course, if they can't urinate or they're going to have problems, do it. No one would say don't do it. It becomes when it's cosmetic. And when it becomes cosmetic, that is taking the bodily autonomy away from someone. And what's interesting with the deaf community is you've seen activists speak up on all sides of these debates. But in the intersex community, despite the fact a lot of medical providers and clinicians talk about it, that being parents speak up or intersex um, uh, people desire these interventions, you don't see them come forward. Why not? I said when I testified in front of that Assembly Health Committee, I didn't know who signed up to uh, uh, testify. I said, you will not hear from one intersex person who opposes the bill. What does that mean? 
You have paid lobbyists, they're representing associations. I'm not against the surgery, do the surgeries. I don't even care if parents want to do the surgery for them. I just want the parents to have the information to know what their other options too, and then they can make their decision. Yeah. It's not medically. But in those situations, you don't have people saying, or do you, I wish that wasn't done to me. That's the difference, Dr. Lane. That's the difference to me, is when you have folks stepping forward and saying, don't do these procedures, slow down the procedures. My question is, why is there... Yeah. But that's what I'm saying, so it's contested. So I think that, it, it, that particular, I agree with you. That situation, there's, there's some deaf folks, I mean, I just reviewed a book uh, called Made to Hear. And, and it's published uh, by a University of Minnesota. It's, it's a really interesting book. It got me ex excited to think about what I know about intersex and how it applies to what's happening in the deaf community. What you see in the deaf community, right, you would know this, it seems like, because you're citing these examples, is that there's a lot more disagreement within, among deaf people themselves. Right, because people speak up on all sides. They have representatives, for example, speaking on behalf of particular implants that are trying to tell parents this could be beneficial to your child. What I'm saying in the case of intersex is we don't see those people publicly coming forward, not even behind a closed wall, like a screen. What are those things called, like Alfred Hitchcock, you know? I, don't know. I thought that was funny, I guess not. Yeah, if I just say one last thing, is that I do think these kinds of collaborations are really important so we can continue the dialogue. Um, all of us can continue to work together and think about how we might continue to learn from everyone else. And that's why as a personal um, you know, activist, but also as a medical sociologist, I strongly believe, let's, hear, let's sit down and talk and, make, and work together to try to promote change. Thank you very much.